Well, welcome everybody to another one of our HydroTerra webinars. Today we're joined by Ian Kluko, Senior Principal Consultant from Prensa, who's going to talk to us all about contamination, remediation, uncertainty, and what can drive it. Some perspectives from a career in finding out. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a picture of our presenter, Ian Kluko, who now works with Prensa. I've had the privilege of working with Ian over many years. We both worked together at Golder Associates and uh, can certainly say that Ian is one of the most experienced people working in the remediation of contaminated land. A little bit about our presenter. So I know Ian personally uh, from university days and uh, he started his life at school at Camberwell Grammar, where he was school captain, before moving on to university at Melbourne University, studying civil engineering. After graduating from there, Ian has over 35 years of experience in the implementation and management of site investigations and remediation and risk-based assessments related to geotechnical and environmental engineering. Over the years, so Ian worked at GHD for about five years before moving to Golder Associates where he worked for 30 years and he has recently started at Prince. So not many people can lay claim to have had 30 years straight in an organisation and I think that's pretty impressive. Ian has led and or managed a number of landmark projects in Australia including the remediation of the 470 hectare Defence Albion Explosives Factory, the remediation of the Orica Chemical and Explosives Facility in Deer Park, the design of the remediation of Defence Site Maribyrnong, the assessment and remediation of Quarantine Station at Point Nepean, and the assessment and remediation of other complex sites such as Scoresby Quarry and Brickwork Site, the Kodak Coburg Manufacturing Facility, and the Hyatt Fitzroy and Bendigo Gasworks. Ian specialises in the efficient assessment and subsequent development of sites with a view to the development of cost-effective remedial solutions and the design management and quality assurance systems required to implement them. So Ian's style of presentation today is going to be centred around a number of case studies and the key learnings from that. We always learn the most from actually doing the projects and I think that's Ian's real strength here is that depth of experience on these projects. Before we let Ian loose, um, we love your Q&A or your questions, I should say. Please feel free to lodge them with the Q&A button at the top of your screens. I will read those out at the end of the session. Why does HydroTerra undertake these webinars? Well, we are passionate about sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education of the industry and we like to take an industry leadership position. And it's a privilege to have Ian here doing that for us today. Over to you, Ian. Thanks very much, Richard. Thanks for the introduction, and um, and uh, thanks to you and Hydroterra for inviting me uh, today to um, to to talk on on your fabulous uh, webinar series. Um, and I suppose it's you know it makes you feel old when you see that introduction. But uh, <laughs> and when I put was putting through this presentation and, and talking to you, Richard, about you know what sort of topic I could do, I, I realised I'm not I'm not the most technical person around. You know, I don't have a lot of don't have a lot of uh, in-depth research on on certain elements of, of, the, of our industry. But what I have done is, I suppose, over 35 years of consulting, learned how to uh, 
uh, deal with our clients, deal with our other stakeholders, um, and successfully um, uh, undertake a, a whole bunch of projects. And through that, I've learned a fair bit about uh, managing some of the things that come up, some of the uncertainties that we have to manage in our industry. And uh, and maybe that's really what we should be calling ourselves, sort of uncertainty consultants, because our industry or the contaminated land industry is, is um, and I'm sure many of the clients that might be on, on on the webinar today are, are uh, is you know it's 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 really one of the more uncertain sciences and engineering elements that um, around and uh, and we really have to uh, focus on on getting better at how we manage the things that we don't know so that we can communicate that better so that's really some of the theme for today so maybe Richard let's uh, let's move forward so let's just start where everything starts a site. For us, it's a, and it's a contaminated site. Now, contaminated sites might look like that. It's pretty obvious in terms of some of the issues there might be there, but really the, they probably most more often look like the next image, something like that. It's just basically a, there's your standard bog stand, you know, bog standard site. It's often what we're, uh, we come up against. And really the, the role of an environmental consultant at the end of the day is... Um, you know, our job is really basically to advise our clients how contaminated it is, how much it's going to cost to clean up, and uh, and also how long it's going to take. So, and that's quite a daunting task, really, at the end of the day, uh, when you this is what you're faced with. You actually got to do a bit of magic, basically, to be able to answer those questions. But I suppose my first lesson for the day is um, expectations, everything. So be really careful when you take that first step on a site. Uh, how you present the expectation as to what can be achieved, what the problems are, how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take. Um, uh, so expectation, I've learned, is one of the biggest things that we need to manage in, in, our, in our industry. So what is uncertain in contaminated land management? There's so many things that are uncertain. So the history of the site, we'll talk about some of that today and some of the examples I've got. Where the contamination is located, what media is contaminated, is it soil, groundwater, vapour? Um, which part of the of the soil profiles in the underlying rock, uh, which part of the aquifer, how many aquifers are contaminated. We've also got the type and the depth of contamination. Um, so, you know, what contaminants have we got? They've all got different properties. There's millions of them. We probably only look at a few hundred. Um, and where and where's it located? At what depth? What's the area of the contamination? How contaminated is it? Because the degree of contamination affects whether or not we need to do something about it, whether we can simply manage it or whether it's not a problem at all. And then the cost of it's completely affected by that degree of contamination as well. What the remediation solution is, that's uncertain as well. There's a bunch of different solutions out there. We probably apply different solutions less in Australia than we do in other parts of the world just because of the availability and market that we have. But still, certainly as we set out on advising on a site, that remediation solution is quite uncertain what the site's going to be used for. Sometimes we don't know. And it's not just the use, it's also that form of development because one of the points I'll make today is, is really in looking at uh, remediation of contaminated land, we need to look at that entire cycle from where the site is today right through to the remediation and post-development, uh, sorry, and post-development use. If we don't have that entire uh, time frame and, and, uh, and risk profile in view, Coming up with cost-effective solutions and 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 managing those uncertainties through this through those solutions is 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 very is very difficult, and you make mistakes and you end up costing your client more money. Um, and then that process to achieve sign-off. What is sign-off? What are we trying to do? What's what's our outcome? We after a regulatory sign-off. We after a commercial transaction. So it's contractual um, sign-off. Is it after? Um, you know, a notice that's been been put on the site that we're trying to actually um, uh, 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 discharge. So it, whole, that process drives a lot um, of how we go about um, contaminated land management and how we can actually manage uncertainty as well. And then also unit rates for remediation, the variability we get in, in remediation, depending on how it's tended, where the risk allocation is, et cetera, that can make costs highly uncertain and, and outcomes highly uncertain as well. So pretty much the scope, time, cost and process are all uncertain. And that's what I've learned over 35 years. So managing that's extremely important. So basically you don't know much at the start. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm moving on. So 
it's one thing saying uncertainty. I suppose I'm, I'm trying to break the uncertainties down into into a couple of classes of uncertainty because it helps me illustrate to my clients how um, uh, you know what what elements are driving their cost and what elements are driving some of their uh, some of their program. So I suppose the first sort of uncertainty is really this risk of finding contamination that's not previously identified. So if you like, it's uncertainty in the unknown. So what what things are possible? We just don't know they're there. We haven't found them. We we think they could be there, but we don't really know. We don't we don't know where they would be, but we haven't really found them. And the second one second one's the uncertainty in the identified contamination. So it's uncertainty in the knowns. So things that we've found, and then it's just what we can't do at an assessment phase or at, at whatever the time phase is in in the process. We don't know exactly what it, how big it is. We don't know. Uh, but we know it's there. We've found it. You know, we might have found a little bit of lead contamination or we might have found a, a tank or something like that. We know there's a, an issue, but we don't know how big it is. Um, there is a third type, which I did use a bit of Donald Rumsfeld in that third type, which is the unknown unknowns. So really these are unknowns that we, do, we don't know about and probably don't expect and we may not ever know about in the lifetime of a project. And really when you think about it, PFAS used to be one of these. I mean... Gosh, I spent 20 years of my life never looking for PFAS. Now every site we look at, PFAS is there. So if you like, there's an unknown unknown where we basically moved through sites, putting houses on them, et cetera, and never looked at PFAS before. Um, but now we know about it and we're looking for it. So th those ones are a lot more difficult and potentially they're, you know, microplastics. Maybe that's something in the future that we'll be looking at in, in on, on sites and, and the like. So there's a bunch of things probably sitting out there that eventually might become part of our practice uh, but uh, at the moment uh, we just move through because we don't know about them. So when you say move through like have you ever been on a project where you've undertaken the remediation and then retrospectively the regulators come back to you and said well actually the world's changed the contaminants of concern have changed and therefore you know, the cleanup no longer stands as such or the certificate of audit or that sort of thing? I think I think some of that does occur from, if you think about, and again, I'm a Victorian focus and I'm not sure how many we have from interstate, but uh, the audit system started in 1990 and things such as certificates, which were basically site suitable for any beneficial use, were given in the nine, early 1990s. And when you look at those certificates, there's uh, um, basically... You know, uh, they, there's a whole bunch of things that we do now that we never did back then. Looking at groundwater was one. Asbestos is another. I mean, we and I'm, I do make this point a bit later on. We used to be able to have one percent sheet asbestos as clean fill. You go and send it to the you know next door neighbours, chuck it on their site for residential, take it to a kindergarten. One percent sheet asbestos. And so when you go when you come back to sites now from that were remediated in the early 1990s, and I'm about to do one um, uh, now asbestos is quite prevalent and so we're basically having to clean up these sites now for asbestos which we never bothered well we never were required or thought to do in those early 90s so that's one that i'd probably say uh but i haven't had the regulator come and say it it's really more a process of, of, of that some of these sites are turning over again after 25 to 30 years they're now turning over into a new lease of life okay interesting all right so, so Let's talk about the two sorts of uncertainties that I mentioned before. So uncertainties in the known and uncertainties and unknown and that uncertainty due to unknowns. So let's just talk about the known. So here's a typical little uh, representation of, of some uh, soil samples. So we've got some green soil samples that are all clean and we've got a red one in the middle there that's dirty. And you know, maybe it's a 30 metre grid or a 25 metre grid or something like that. So how big is that red spot in the middle? So, you know, maybe it's an area of X, whatever that is, X squared. And then, but it could be maybe the yellow area, which is 4X. You know, you, you get a basically a squared relationship with distance. So the further you move from a point, you know, in length and width, you're going to square that, that distance up for the uh, square the area to, uh, to get the area. So just al already from looking at how big that area is, we, we sort of get this variation from X to 4X, so four times. 
And then in terms of depth, that's the next thing. You know, often we're only sampling out there at you know half meter, one meter intervals, or whatever it might be. Clients don't want to pay for sampling a hundred mil intervals. So I want to, you know, we want to be a cost more, uh, be as cost effective as we can with the assessment. So we might have a, a dirty point at a meter, another dirty point at two meters. So, uh, sorry, and a clean point at two meters. So how deep is this contamination? Is it one meter deep or two meters? So you double that up again. So then you've got a variation of between X and four X, just eight uh, X on the volume. And then how badly contaminated is it? So if the point is a, you know, I'm just, I've used a Victorian reference here, Cat C, Category C for offsite disposal, maybe that's $200 a tonne. And if it's a Category A, maybe it's 600 bucks a tonne, just by example. And so we're getting a variation of about 24 times based on one dirty point amongst whatever that is, seven, six clean points. There's a variation of, of 24 times on what the potential cost could be on dealing with that point. And so that's, if you like, what I'm talking about with uncertainty on the known. So we know that issue is there, but we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost. Now on the next one, it's really about, um, so now, now we just, we think about the unknown contamination, what I'm talking about with these are things like infrastructure that we think is going to be there, things like underground storage tanks. So if we've, I don't know, if we've got a fuel depot or, a, or actually like, Something like a housing, we often we find we're doing a lot of housing commission um, uh, projects here down in Victoria. Um, oil tanks, heating oil tanks have been used, um, uh, centralised heating oil tanks have been used to heat them. So you suspect there's going to be these tanks there, but sometimes you can't see them or they've been, they've been decommissioned over the time. There's one that would be an example where you suspect they're going to be there, but you don't know where they are. Things like asbestos in soil, when you find construction waste on a, on the site, you suspect it's going to be there, but you're not really sure. The things like burials, some sort of unidentified contaminated soil, they're things within the realm of expectation that might be on your site that you might need to account for. That we've gone out and we've done our assessment, we've done our 25 metre, 30 metre grid, we've done some targeted work, we've done all our history. We haven't found everything. We've found some stuff, but we haven't found everything. So there could be some other things there. So we need to. Um, make sure that we account for that when we're, we're advising our clients regarding what sort of uncertainties might remain. So the, the clearly there's going to be a higher risk of unknown contamination, so this second form, when we haven't done a great job on our assessment, by, be that the site history, be that the soil sampling, when we've got an inadequate quantity of assessment, so we've sampled it, I don't know, We've gone out and done a hundred meter grid. Well, I've done ten samples on a twenty hectare industrial site. You know, I mean, clearly there's massive gaps in there. So we're going to get a lot more of this unknown contamination. If we have, if we've got a poor understanding and poor interpretation of the results, we probably won't understand that these suspected things are there, but we haven't found them. And then also when we have an inappropriate strategy, um, that also increases this ability, this issue around unknowns. In that, you know. Um, if, if we don't, if we haven't got a strategy that's expecting some of this or we're, we're not targeting things around underground services, which we know might be a source, then we're going to get this sort of uh-oh moments as we get into the site and we find these the, these issues occur. And again, I'm going to put some, give some, you some examples of that coming up. So there that, so, so the other part around unknown contamination is un unfortunately development is the best way that we find these un unidentified contamination issues. It's not assessment. So this little graphic, it's just something I've, I've, and some people may have seen this before because I've presented it a number of times. If you look along the bottom, this is a time phase for the development of a project from you know, assessment through remediation, development and occupation of the site. And if you look at that green line, that's sort of the, 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 the degree of site disturbance. So through the assessment phase, we, we go out and do some boreholes and some test pits. We don't really disturb the site very much. Then the remediation phase, we might go and dig some holes, dig out a tank. Um, there could be a bit of demo involved. So we disturb the site a little bit more. And it's in, in development where there's this massive site disturbance. You know, the first thing a, a developer does will chuck a, a sewer straight down the centre of the site, you know, a trench right through the middle of the site. There's our cross section. Um, and so the risk of finding, you know, um, uh, remaining contamination is, is far more elevated because the amount of site disturbance we uh, do during development. So you can imagine on that red line that I've got through the centre there, that's the remaining un unidentified contamination. We, 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 find, we find the uh, fair bit through the assessment phase, we find a fair bit through the remediation phase, but there will always be some residual contamination as we move into development. 
And really what I'm trying to show with the graphic here is that's going to pretty much be found during uh, site development. It's a really important understanding because, you know, it's one of these things that you get the phone call from the developer to say, oh, we found a tank, you know, you've done a terrible job. And it's like, well, you know, it's, and we put the warning in the in the in the uh, report that there might be a tank, and we put the warning there could be some sheet some asbestos in soil. I mean, that's the classic one. Um, these things are, are are expected that they still might be there, and we haven't found them. But site uh, that site development is going to be the time when we actually find them. So it's it's just an important thing to recognise. Do you think? Um people spend too much money on assessment and they should just sort of keep that money for doing analysis during actual works? So I think there is an optimum degree of assessment. I've got a site which I probably shouldn't name particular sites, but there's a site which is probably one of the biggest remediation, <laughs> remediation projects left in Melbourne <laughs> where I don't think further assessment is going to make a whole lot of difference. I think there's just so many unknowns. There are so many unknowns you actually got to get, and so many constraints you actually got to get in there and start. So I think there is a point when assessment has to stop, and you have to actually start doing some remediation to be able to do exactly this. We need to be able to actually get some big open uh, areas to be able to find some of this unknown, which is because there's so many. The high, it's a high degree of unknowns. We have to actually get in there and start methodically clearing areas. And so I think there is a point where assessment, it depends what the point of the assessment is. Assessment to meet regulatory requirements, we have to do that. But if it's assessment to manage risk, and I will make, I'm, I do make this point a bit later on, there's a point where we run out of the value of assessment in reducing uncertainty. In fact, these next couple of slides will probably pick some of that up. The value of assessment in reducing uncertainty uh, yeah, it becomes very low. And and I think one of the keys and skills in consulting is only to do enough assessment that we need to answer the question to the risk degree that we need, uh, and but be able to communicate that properly to our clients. So how can we communicate this uncertainty that I'm talking about? So, and this is probably going to your question, Richard, to some degree, but for a start, if there is uncertainty, we need to find tools to be able to um, uh, 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 communicate it, and so, and also that on and and communicating it through the different because it will vary for the different scenarios and outcomes that we're looking for for a site. So, um, so we need to make sure from a uh, so if we're basically got a site with some, you know, with some uncertainties in it, and we're going to send it, and we're going to in, um, redevelop or we're going to have ongoing industrial use on the site. You can imagine the uncertainties are a little bit less for ongoing industrial use. We're not going to basically go and disturb the soil too much. Uh, we might have some issues in there, but it's managed by the slab over the top, et cetera, versus we're going to dig it, we're going to demolish the site and we're going to put it forward for residential use and we're going to have small you know, townhouses and we're going to um, basically dig up the site. So the uncertainty will actually be different in both of those scenarios. We need to make sure that qualitatively we can communicate that. The next thing will be around undertaking making sure when you're looking at cost estimates and quantities and and, and 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 around contamination management that we're actually you know we can estimate volumes and we can estimate costs why don't we estimate uncertainties as well it's subjective and I'm, i'd say quantities are subjective as well to a large degree it's subjective in many ways but with experience i think we can get close to where we think those uncertainties are probabilities if you like but so so estimating that along with these other parameters that we estimate i think is also very important so Uncertainty estimates can only be made on that available information. I think that's important to know as well that clearly, and this gets comes a bit to your point, Richard, that the more uncertainty, uh, the more investigation that we do, we get to a point where we've, we've maxed out the reduction we can do in uncertainty. But if we haven't got to that point, you know, we've, this is really those un uncertainty around the knowns, if you like. Um, if we haven't got to that point, we've got to make, we, we, we know that we can do more work. We can say to our clients, look, look, the, this is our range and costs at the moment, but if we did A, B and C, another couple of groundwater wells here and filled in some data gaps, the range will reduce. And we'll get to that in a second as well. So understanding it's a point, it's uncertainty is around a point in time in the information available is really important. But if we go and do that extra work, I don't think, we've got to make sure the client does the, have, hasn't got the expectation that the costs are necessarily going to come down What's coming down is the uncertainty. It's not necessarily the cost because we might realise some of these risks that we've talked about and the cost might actually go up or the expected cost might actually go up. So that's really important. So it's all about the, the, the these 
this this education of, of of what it is that we're doing and what and what some of the risks are that are remaining. And I suppose my last point there is no, never would I put unknown unknowns in there. There's a whole lot of things like I don't know if the site's got a nuclear bomb on it. I don't think it will. You know things like, and, and 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 the like. So. There, there will be scenarios where there's things that are completely out of the box that we didn't know about that will not be in those estimates, those uncertainty estimates, because they're completely unexpected. And I don't think we can account for those. And I don't think it's reasonable to account for them. So let's go to that next slide, Rich. And I just want to show you how I visualise this. So this, and maybe some of the people who know me have seen this sort of representation before. And again, this is a subjective, but it's a representation of uncertainty, okay? So along the bottom, we've got cost. Cost in dealing with contamination, whatever that might be, through the strategy. That's in millions of dollars there, just to give you a scale. And up the left-hand side, I've just got the probability of the cost being exceeded. This is my form of representation of uncertainty. So as you move from the left-hand side, the left-hand side, we're saying there's 100% probability of a cost being exceeded, i.e. that's a minimum cost the minimum cost as we go out there tomorrow to do our remediation and our development or whatever, the minimum cost on the bottom right hand side is it's never a maximum cost, but it's uh, getting asymptotically down to the 0% probability of cost being exceeded. So that's the high end cost. That's reflecting all of these uncertainties to say if everything went bad, we're going to hit the $5 million mark. And so I've, I've indicated on this one, the left hand, you know, someone's selling the site, the left hand top one, the minimum cost or the low cost, that'll be what the principal or the vendor will be saying is the cost of remediation. The bottom right hand one, a developer or a purchaser or a contractor will be saying, no, 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 it's five million bucks. It's not a million bucks. And then our, the consultant should be somewhere in the middle, the 50th percentile, if they're not basically being biased in their advice and, 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 and basically being conservative as well to try and say, well, geez, I don't want to get this wrong because uh, you know, our client will come back and, and, and sue me because we got it wrong. The 50 percentile should be our expected costs, 50 percent chance of it being under or over. So that's where I'd sit in the middle. But in the shape of this, and this is why I like, I like it because of the shape, the bottom, the tail at the, the 3 million to 5 million, that blue area, the tail is reflecting a lot of these unknowns, things that we suspected are there, the low probability because we've done good investigation potentially. Um, there's some low probability they're going to be there, but they could be there and they could impact on costs and some of these could have large impact on costs. So you might see a long tail on these distributions that reflect some of those low probability um, issues. And then on the slope, this is, you know, through that sort of general range of probabilities, this is really indicating our confidence around generally these, these the, the known contamination and the variation. How much confidence do we have on, the, on this known, the stuff that we go out tomorrow and go and dig you know, there's a little bit of variance on it. How much confidence do we have? And that slope, the steeper the slope, you can imagine we have more confidence. So through those those, those probability ranges, we see a small variation in, in cost because we've we've done a good assessment and the site's pretty easy and we can we can be fairly confident. So that's just a visual way of representing it. Is it right? No. Is it subjective? <laughs> yeah. Is it a way to represent ranges of cost? Yeah, it is. And it gives a client an opportunity to pick a different risk profile when they're negotiating, as, as often we're doing, and negotiating a sale and negotiating a, a, a risk position with a contractor, they can pick some numbers in here and understand where they sit in that rather than the, than the consultant just come out and saying, oh, it's going to be 4 million bucks because I don't really want to be sued on this. It's 4 million. It gives no movement whatsoever. It just says it's 4 million bucks. So that's why the representation has the power to allow um, a client to actually choose where they want to be on this. So maybe moving on, Richard. So I think just before we get on to a couple of examples, so I think so that, that was sort of the, sort of the background of, of of uncertainty. But really, I suppose, how can we better manage it? I, I just think recognising it, accepting it. There's going to be uncertainty. So it's our clients accepting it as well as us as, as, as practitioners or, or consultants as practitioners accepting it and building that right expectation and educating um, the, at stakeholders around that uh, uncertainty. And, and I suppose that point I made around that treating contaminated land as a continuum from assessment through remediation to development and post-development use, 
the reason always want to have a look through the so you don't just look at it as oh we're just going to assess and remediate the site to get the audit or whatever we're going to get or to get a dsi done and and have the risk managed if we're not looking into the future as to how this site's going to be used for a start we could be creating more costs further down the track but also the other thing is that we're missing opportunities to manage uncertainty as well because the site's going to end up being i don't know five meters of fill is going to be placed on it and and it's going to be used for a uh, heavy end industrial use then we've got an ability to manage uncertainty a lot better than we than we do uh if it's going to be sensitive use and it's all going to be excavated down a meter or two and we're going to crystallize all the contamination focusing this comes to your point to again, Richard, before focusing assessment efforts on those aspects had the greatest impact on uncertainty. So just going out and continuing to sample to get down to a grid that we want to get down to, is that really changing that graph, changing the, the tail, changing the slope? Or is it just, is we're just spending money to find out more about what we already know? Now we might have to do that from a regulatory point of view, that's fine. But if we're about risk reduction to try and get better outcomes, then maybe that's not, not where we need to be. And then just heading on to the next one, mate. So in general, if we do a quality site assessment, so site history sampling, conceptual model, and a good strategy, those two uncertainties that, we're, that I was speaking about, we're more likely to have um, uncertainty driven by the uncertainty in the known and identified, and less likely to be this risk of the unknown. It's not always the case. So I gave this example of the large site that's still sitting there in Melbourne where there's a lot of uncertainty that just assessment's not gonna get, get rid of it. But generally, we're going to move more to the, to the, to the, well, in fact, I've got a visual representation of this on the next slide, but we're going to melt more to steepening up that slope and less in the tail. And then we want to make sure that we're tailoring developments to the residual uncertainty um, so that we're managing res, uh, residual uncertainty in the contamination. So making sure that we're designing developments. If there's areas where there, there's still risk, in the outcome that we achieve through remediation and contamination management, sometimes through good design, we can manage the uncertainty a lot better than if we put, you know, go and put your playground on that area versus put whatever less sensitive, um, 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 I mean, that's just in a, at a small scale, but a less sensitive part of a development over that area. So we can actually manage uncertainty through development. And then also around uncertainty can also be managed um, through the contracting out of uncertainty to the parties best able to manage it. So things like, you know, in the 90s, we used to contract out every uh, remediated site that was coming along from the government in particular, and that's probably still do it to some degree, all the volume risk would go straight to the to the contractor. And it's like, is that sensible? Like, how does the contractor manage the volume risk uh, in terms of contamination if the, there's need inadequate assessment uh, and the like? And all you're going to get is a high premium. They're going to be, the contract is going to be at the end of that graph Giving it, that's what that's what you're going to pay versus some sort of better model in between where the risk the risk allocation is a little bit better as to who can best manage that. So that's contracting out to another strategy. So then just to the last bit of this sort of introduction, what does that look like? So in that sort of presentation I gave before of that graphical presentation, say the right hand graph, the orangey one is uh, is the one that you've got before you go and do some targeted assessment. If you go and do a little bit more targeted assessment to try and that that works on those uncertainties a little bit more, you can see the blue one. And again, it's not high, massively highlighting, but but maybe the blue one you're making your your tail a little bit smaller. Maybe you've re reduced in this case your uncertainty by you know five hundred six hundred thousand, and then you've made the slope a little bit tighter as well. So we're actually starting to squeeze up where we think the probable ranges are of 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 um of the cost of remediation. So. That's kind of what we're trying to get to. It's really at the end of the day, that's through what I've just mentioned there, that's kind of the visual representation of better better uncertainty management. Ian, just um, on this probability number, is there, I know in mining, there's various um, software packages now which sort of help you and say, is it really worth drilling another hole? You know, it actually automatically counts, calculates you levels of uncertainty is there an equivalent that's used for contam land in deriving that percentage there have been look and again I, I, i'm not painting myself as the greatest probabilistic mathematician around but there are certainly pure mathematical probabilistic packages around contaminated land there's been many over the last 10 or 20 years 
I'm a much more simple person than that. Um, my experience will tell me that's so in the mining, what you generally have, and so the Krigging type sort of stuff, and we've used, I've used it in PF, when we've got single contaminants and single sources, then, you know, a lot of the Krigging will work. But the problem with a lot of contaminated land is that we've got multiple sources of different shapes and sizes that we don't actually know sometimes, long, thin ones, deep ones, you know, they're, and they're different and they're overlaying, especially, if, you know, a lot of it's around just crappy industrial fill that we've got in, in, in our cities that we've had over the last, you know, 200, uh, 200 years. And so a lot of that sort of, and again, if you know, there's a few few people out there that I don't know who's on the on this webinar, but there's probably much better mathematicians and probabilistic people than me that would say, no, these are really effective. But what I've what I've generally found is this sort of representation that I'm putting forward is more a, it's a much simpler experience based putting some estimates, subjective estimates based on experience and knowing the sort of bounds of where those estimates are and building from a grassroots up to, to come up with these sorts of estimates versus the mathematical, let's throw in a whole lot of points. And I'm sure I'll, I'll be close to, I'm close to retirement. So by the time I retire at the end of the day, there'll be some AI that'll probably do this a lot better than me. But throwing in a whole bunch of points for lead and then crigging it up, crigging it up to, to put the probability of the area of lead in my experience, in many of my sites, is useless because at the end of the day, it doesn't. There's, there's so many preferential pathways and infrastructure and things in the way that we just can't model because we don't have the subsurface model compared to mining, where we know the geological structures and we know the bedding and we know the, the fractures and the and we know how these things form. It, it's a lot more of a whilst it's uncertain, the conceptual model thing is a lot stronger. Than I think many that we often have in contaminated land. So in my experience, I haven't seen a great set of models, mathematical models that you just throw a whole lot of stuff in and get it, get these probabilities out. Except on single source, single source issues, I've seen yes, they work. They can work on single source issues quite well. Thanks for that. So here, these next sort of ten slides are just some. They're nothing earth shattering. It's just a few things that I've pulled out of my, of my career where. Some of those uncertainties have come to fruition and of course the big problem and i'm just highlighting them so maybe you have to think about them next time you're looking at your sites <clears throat> so this first one's just a um uh this is a food processing plant and there's a big slab there on the right hand side four hectares of slab there had been a, a div six done or in victoria so a pre a pre demolition um uh, uh, uh hazardous material survey had been done uh, everything was hunky dory, um, and basically, what happened is when the building had been demolished, the slab had a mastic in it, which is an asbestos um, uh, mastic in it, and um, that hadn't been identified. And when you look at that slab and you look at all those sort of lines, I um, mean, they're not a, even all the expansion joints, but when you look at all the expansion joints in the slab, the process at the end of the day was to cut either side of the of the mastic and pull that the concrete and the mastic out and get rid of that as asbestos waste. So then we could demo the rest of the slab. Um, so that saw cut on each of those joints, you know, it was about 600,000, which was about 15% of the remediation cost just to get rid of the slab because we hadn't picked up the asbestos mastic. Now I, I would say over my, you know, this, we'd probably pick this up much more now in these last five to 10 years. than prior to that, I think a lot of this material would have just been going off for recycling, uh, um, because I don't think it would have been picked up. So, um, look, I suppose the lesson here, and I've got lessons on each of these, and um, I suppose now I've moved to Prensa and have a lot more understanding of, uh, of some of the hazardous materials uh, side of the business. Um, it's recognising the gap between a pre-demolition hazmat and what's actually there and what needs to be managed in terms of hazardous materials. Just because you have a compliant, a compliant like uh, uh, hazmat, um, pre-demolition hazmat survey so it might meet all your regulations in your state here in Victoria to div 6 it doesn't mean it's captured everything and so how you manage that risk with your contractor hey, and, and price it is really really important and can lead to significant cost overruns on projects if it isn't managed well so that's lesson number one so just oh, excuse me we move off lesson number one what is mastic just the, um, the um, 
it's it's the material that's in between the expansion joints on the on the uh, sealant in between the expansion joints on the slab. Okay, thank you. So the next lesson, and we're learning it more and more every day. Asbestos is everywhere. I know everyone knows this, but gee, it's a it's become a major major headache in projects that wasn't a headache in the nineties. Probably wasn't much of a headache in the two thousands. It's a very much a headache since in the you know in the last in the last ten or fifteen years. So I mentioned before that you know well, I thought that asbestos issues would be gone in my career. Um, you know we used to be able to have this one percent sheet asbestos in film material. So one percent, just so everyone knows, and if you had a cubic meter of soil, I'm pretty sure it's ten centimeters by ten centimeters of asbestos. That's a lot of sheet asbestos. Um, that used to be clean filled. And and of course, we've all learned this lesson, but maybe some on the call haven't if they're not uh, environmental consultants, but boreholes have their limitations. So I'm just trying to indicate that little picture on the right. There's some bits of asbestos on the ground, just circled in, in orange. You go and put a borehole, if that was sort of layered through your fill layer and you go and put a borehole through the middle, you won't find those three pieces. You're just going to find some soil, some fill material in between. So it's really, really difficult to pick up asbestos in boreholes, and indeed, it's 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 you know in our regulations now that well, it, it, and it's very well known that borehole isn't a great boreholes aren't great for picking up asbestos where it's suspected it's there. So, um, and there's been massive cost increases on jobs uh, where asbestos hasn't been identified, and and it continues to happen every project, almost every project. So it is. It's still a major problem in terms of um, uh, uh, managing it from a workforce point of view. When often we assess the sites, and and that's the other thing, the communication too. From what we've left behind at assessment, we might leave some pieces of asbestos. But when a developer comes and they have a sensitised workforce, I mean, we've just seen the stuff in New South Wales regarding mulch and asbestos, and in Victoria, when you have a sensitised community and a sensitised workforce, and you go and find a few pieces of asbestos, suddenly we have a major issue on our hands in terms of, of, of managing that. And if it hasn't been thought about at the contracting stage as well, it's a major cost issue as well. So really the lesson always is, and many of us have learned it, always do test pits where there's fill, especially filled with construction waste in it. And even when there's concrete, concrete hazard, and I've got clients who want me to cut the concrete, even on a, on a, on a due diligence for an acquisition, go out and cut, cut concrete to do test pits to try and find asbestos. It's very expensive and annoying that we have to go and cut concrete and reinstate it, but it's a major risk to them and they need to manage it. So asbestos is everywhere. This one's a story from my youth. Um, it's about a rogue pipeline. I was, no, hang on, mate. Sorry, can you just, um, so essentially this is one of the larger remediations I did earlier in my life. Um, and uh, we had all sorts of, major facilities on this site that we knew we had to remediate you know on that drawing you've got water treatment plants and there's a you know some big asbestos buildings there and there's a whole lot of other stuff and essentially those two orange circles are there's a couple of pits they're called acid pits it's like all right well we know there's a bit of a pipeline and so you know we've mapped those and then that next picture richard on our sort of model of it we had a, a purple line you know, the purple line amongst some big buildings and big stockpiles and all that sort of stuff. And we were probably, I don't know, we were 80% through the project uh, at this point in time. Before we tackled this, we'd work from north to south on the site and here's the south. And uh, essentially what happened at the end of the day is we started tackling this purple line, being an underground service. And it was a, it was an acid uh, sewer uh, um, effluent line. And uh, when we got to dig it, uh, basically, there was no bottom on the on the pipe. The pipe had been um, eaten away by the acid over the years, and essentially had been leaking for years and years and years. And so, in the end, we took forty thousand cubic meters out of that purple line. Uh, represented probably uh, something in the order of five to ten percent of the total project um, uh, remediated volume. Some of the worst material on the site. And uh, it came quite late in the piece, so it was very difficult to manage in the solution that we had. And um, and really, I suppose um, there's some just some great coloured water down there from the. This, it was nitrotoluene, so we get sort of a the, the, the classic red water in explosives factory. 
it's really about underground services. We kind of know they're there. You know, there's underground services on every site. You've got to really think about whether they are a source. You know, and there's a whole lot of ways that they can be a source of contamination. And don't just ignore them because, you know, oh, that's a pipeline. It's very small. This was massive. It had a massive impact on the project. And, um, and yeah, and, and there still are some impacts around associated with it. So um, underground services are important and an important source of uncertainty that need to be thought about in your, in your, in your conceptual model and remediation. On to the next one. Oh, this one's just a interesting one where um, it was quite interesting. I did the Kodak plant in Coburg and I suppose, you know, not all photo plants have a silver lining. You think um, uh, silver is going to be the issue on a photo, a photograph. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe the younger people on the, I'm starting to sound really old, young people might know, but uh, pho <laughs> photographic paper, uh, silver is one of the main uh, uh, components in, in, in that. And so we thought we might have a bit of a silver issue. Uh, we found very little silver on the entire site. It's because they, treated the silver like gold. Uh, it was extremely um, valuable to them. So basically all the processes where the silver was involved, they basically did as much retention of wastewater, much retention of, of, of solids to try and extract the silver. So we found very little silver. So on this massive, you know, Kodak plant, photographic plant, one of the biggest issues was the buried fire main. It was asbestos coated steel. There was five kilometers of it. It was quite deep in, in many places. And actually, sort of, you know, taking that 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 coating, the asbestos coating, and and um, and um, in a safe way, you know, grinding that back to be able to cut the pipe, slinging the pipe, getting rid of the pipe as asbestos waste. Um, back then, it was really it was really quite a cost. And so, you know, I suppose my lesson here was, it's not always the obvious cost, obvious thing that's going to be the cost and the issue. This one's fairly standard, you know, fire main in, a, in an industrial site and ended up being quite a significant cost and an effort and a timeline uh, burner too to try and um, uh, finish all of these areas. There's a lesson on that one. Now this one's uh, about a little bit about history and understanding what site history does. No, sorry, I'll just go back one. Um, so we just had a standard rural property out in the west of Melbourne we did the normal thing of a phase one. We did some sampling as well, try and indicate if we had any issues, fairly broad scale sampling because we couldn't find anything in the history. And the area was subsequently subdivided for residential and all the houses were being built and there was a small area that was left for the school. And just so you go to the next photo, that's the site for the school. You can see the houses to the, that have been built around it. Just happened to be that right where they wanted the school, uh, when the assessment was done for the sale of the school, there was some lead shot and some clay targets found. So essentially what we had here, and I've done a bunch of firing ranges over my time, but this one's really interesting for me because there was absolutely no documentation. There was a reasonable amount of lead shot and a reasonable amount of target to show that it had been used for a period of time, but there was no sort of um, aerial photography that would pick up, you know, the... These uh, basically with clay target, you've got your uh, the targets get thrown by a machine, uh, so you can shoot them. So generally, you have infrastructure associated with them, and so you'd be able to pick it up. You would have thought on an aerial photo that someone's put the infrastructure. So what we basically thought is that this is potentially a farmer and maybe a farmer and their mates are in in the area, and they might have had a mobile um, target throwing machine because, you know. Well, one of the lessons here is around aerial photos. When you go back in history, they're often it's at 10 meter, ten year inter intervals. And in 10 years, a lot can happen on a site. And we, we just couldn't pick up this clay target shooting club at all, or, or, um, area at all in any of the photos. And uh, yet it was quite a significant issue. It ended up being a couple of, a couple of million dollars to remediate that we didn't really know about. Uh, it didn't pick up in the due diligence. Um, so it's it, the lesson to me is... is around looking back in history now, the older I get, the harder it is to look back because basically people don't have memories now that go you know, back, certainly from a, a working sense. They're generally not going back earlier than the 70s because you think about, well, you know, um, workers like, you know, it might be 10 years older than me or whatever, the, you know, the, the, they might think about, they might go back to the 70s and that's about it. And then you can go to the locals who are a bit older and the locals might go back to the 60s. But a lot happened between the 60s and in the 1880s in Melbourne, you know, so or in in and in Australia, 
So that sort of understanding that there's a fair amount of uncertainty in history is really, really important. The best, even with the best history, we're still going to have gaps. And then if we do history poorly, we're certainly going to have gaps. And I, I use this one in an ACLCA course I do as well. Um, it is one of my favourites, but um, it just, again, demonstrates one of the uh, issues around uh, not going back far enough in history. So we inherited a site that had, had a history investigation that really only went back to the 70s on a defence site. And the site had been made, you know, given us uh, uh, an audit for um, basically for residential. And, and, of course, the developer came and the first thing they did was the developer stripped the site ready for the houses and put a sewer through the middle. And when they put a sewer through the middle, they started finding some fairly odorous material. And what was associated with the odour was these round, purple round circles. And um, and we went back to history and we couldn't find anything. And then we thought, well, we didn't have any aerial photos back to the 40s because this history only started in the 70s. Go to the 42 aerial, and it's a bit hard to pick up on this, but those orange circles and those black dots, that's a drum store. So the 1940s, of course, it's a defence site. You should go back to the 1940s at the defence site. It's when the war effort was. These drums of um, ethyl aniline were uh, all over the site, and they're the things that had been leaking, um, monoethyl aniline. And so what, what we got were these sort of um, uh, just random circles of some drums that had leaked. Many of them didn't leak, but some of them did. And so we eventually had to pull out 30,000 cubic metres of material in this area uh, just to get it ready for the houses that had already been sold. Uh, we had to do it over a Christmas period and and uh, pull out a fair bit of material so we could um, re-audit the site and uh, and 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 honour the contracts for the sale and get these houses built. So I suppose the, the lesson in this one again is I'll just Richard one more um, is really you know again about good quality history. So the previous one was about the fact that even with a good quality history, you still got gaps. But if there's stuff to be found out. Try and find it out. It's much easier finding out the site history. You get more bang for your buck at site history and more uncertainty reduction in site history than you do in, in sampling. Uh, so that was that was quite a significant uh, oversight, that one. And then even with a good site history, as we said, there's still some gaps. So Armadale Gasworks, there was reasonable documentation. And then uh, we get down towards the end of where we thought we we're going to be. Gasworks are always great for finding unexpected things. But we did find these great. I'll, I'll put this in just because I love these beehive tar wells. Um, we found these couple of beehive tar, tar wells, and uh, which we had to deal with. I mean, one of the most fun parts was the fact that when the archaeologists and historians came down to have a look at it, you know, the, the concept of trying to keep this sort of tar encrusted, smelly uh, brick structure, try and keep it. I, I think it was they didn't really want to go too close to it. So um, I think that was fairly. We won that battle fairly easily. Um, but yeah, there was a photographic record made of these. But um, but yeah, look, it was these these sorts of things come up. This might sit, you know, this probably sits in the realm of the expected because we were on a uh, on a gas works. But it was a little bit unexpected because we thought the tar wells were in a different area to this, and we'd already found them. And these were obviously a, again going back in history. These were another uh, round of tar wells that they had on site. What is a beehive? <clears throat> Tar. Why is it called a beehive tar well? Because of the shape, mate. Um, Looks like a beehive, doesn't it? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. All right. I think I'm running, starting to talk too much, so I might need me to keep moving along. But um, look, this just very quickly, again, this is just because I like telling a few stories, and it's probably all I have in my life for a few stories left. So uh, this is a local park. Uh, we found some holes. Next one, mate. They found some holes in it one day like this. And um, and when you actually go back into the history of this one, uh, next one, you go back to the 1940 photo and that's the side up there in the in the right, slightly right-hand corner. You can see the camouflage over the top of it. This is right in the middle of urban, urban Melbourne. And uh, in the end, uh, it was quite, it was just it was a fascinating site in that it was, it was a little basalt quarry uh, the Navy had bought the site. It was about a kilometre from the waterfront. The Navy bought the site. They built an oil tank down to 11 metres inside the quarry, covered it in camouflage. The council bought it in the in the 70s and then, you know, basically landfilled it and created a park. 
and um, and uh, it was just uh, just one of those unusual features in Melbourne. There's a whole lot of other stories about the neighbour Socrates who knew all about this, uh, uh, but uh, it was it was just one of those unknowns, one of those things you didn't expect at all. But uh, it was a, just a classic uh, classic piece of um, of history. And uh, but once we knew about it, we knew what to do. We had a strategy, and we knew how to solve those voids where a dog had fallen down a void, and we knew how to basically um, put a remediation um, strategy together. But until we had that missing piece of information, the uncertainties were very high. So it's about as close as I've got to an unknown unknown. Did the dog survive? I, th I think so. That's good. Uh, this one, look, just. This one's a, was an unusual one, although well, not unusual in operating landfills, but we had a landfill on site that has been closed for 15 years. And every morning, every cold morning, we'd see a wisp of smoke come out of the gas um, uh, vents. And then uh, one day we thought we better, we had to tackle this wisp of smoke because we thought there was a bit of a fire and it ended up being six months. This is, I mean, I know from an environmental management point of view, it doesn't look so great, but this is 1999. So maybe I can be forgiven for that. Uh, but basically, um, uh, this was a, a, a 12 metre excavation, uh, six months of work, um, a lot of people in suits and a lot of effort to extinguish a whole lot of burning tyres that were at the bottom of this landfill. And, uh, and look, they're rare. So this is one of these advanced landfills. That, landfill fires are rare in, in sort of old and closed landfills, uh, but they're significant. Uh, and I know we're doing that. There's some stuff happening in Victoria around actual active landfills that have fires, but um, but yeah, this was that was quite a, a significant event. A couple more, just around just around soil treatment. Look, I'm not an expert in soil treatment. I use experts around me. I've seen a lot of them, a lot of soil treatments from bioremediation, biopiling, mobilisation, on-site soil treatment. That is. Um, enhanced thermal conduction, which is quite interesting. Uh, batch thermal desorption, in situ thermal, thermal desorption. Used many of them on, on a lot of sites. And I suppose all I say is I've, I've some some of them, many of them work, and some of them haven't. And and I suppose I've learned that it's a science. It really is a science. Getting treatment right and knowing people, knowing, making sure you've got contractors who know what they're doing. And I suppose one of the lessons around managing uncertainty for me is. If a contractor was sell is selling a, a system to me or treatment to me, I contract on the outcomes. So essentially, it's not about doing it. It's about actually achieving what needs to be done. So I'm very happy to contract out a black box with, here's a dirty stockpile. You give me a clean stockpile and tell me how much it's going to cost. The process in between becomes something that I can't manage and my client can't manage the risk and the uncertainty. That's where those people in, in the know can manage it. So that's one of those examples where you're contracting the risk out appropriately is important in managing uncertainty. That's really the point of that slide. It's not about going into detail and treatment methods. It's just, I've seen a lot of them. Um, here's another one just around groundwater. Again, I'm not a groundwater person generally, I'm mainly soil, but it's just an important one about this sort of post assessment groundwater condition and what it might mean to a development. So it might be great news for a site where you, you've got a site where it's not the source of groundwater contamination. But maybe there's contaminants present in the groundwater from an off-site source, things like PFAS, chlorinated. So the risk is fine for your ongoing use, no problem. Okay, but then the next thing happens, your client wants to redevelop the site and place a sewer that goes beneath the water table. So surely, you know, under the EPA regulations, the polluter pays. You know, this is coming from off-site, polluter's going to pay. I've got to put my, my sewer in. I've got to manage all this water and you've polluted it. Well, I don't know. I've never got legal people on here. I don't know how often that you know, the, uh, what the success rate is of someone trying to get money for contaminated groundwater from, I don't know, the 10, the 10 facilities that are to your north, to, to the upgrading of you. So in the end, this is a, can be a major problem because they've got to pull the water out, treat it, can't necessarily re-inject it and got to dispose of it. And it's a massive cost for putting what would, you know, normally on a line item in a development for a sewer might be, uh, you know, we know what the cost is, the pipe is, and the trench, etc. The water management can, can become significant. So, contaminated groundwater may not trigger a mediation action, but it it may be a significant construction cost. So again, that's coming down to that concept of looking at the whole life cycle of a of a site and understanding the implications of contamination, so we can advise our our clients uh, uh, better uh, around that. And I think that comes to the next, the last slide I've got anyway. I think Richard. 
is around again expectation. It is interesting. We 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 do environmental audits and detailed site investigations and and um and sites are sold with those and everyone goes beauty, you know, we've got an audit for residential use or we have a investigation and assess the site suitable for residential use. There's no contamination. Right? That's quite often that's what it means out in the industry. There's no contamination. It's really that recognition that these documents, the audits and the and the and the assessments, they're done for a certain reason. And they're done to a certain risk requirement around suitability and the like, meeting regulatory requirements, et cetera. They're not done for um, assessing soil for offsite disposal or for the groundwater management associated with sewer, um, with that sewer in, um, installation. So it's important to recognise that there's, in, certainly in Victoria, and I know uh, in other states as well, you've got the sort of assessment framework and then you've got your off-site disposal and some of your management framework, construction management fr framework. And they're two different systems. And as a result, we get clashes and people think they've got no more costs because the site's clean because it's for residential, but there can be massive costs in construction depending on how that's married into, the, into those residual risks. So really, I think that's the end of sort of some of those examples. And I've just got a little summary, I think, coming out with the next... Uh... So really, I suppose all I'm basically saying is uncertainty is part of contaminated land management. So let's recognize it. And and it, it's just really saying, you know, we, we've got to recognize and understand what's actually driving it. And we'll always be targeting on targeting what's driving it to try and get, try and reduce that uncertainty, reduce those unknowns, reduce the cost factor or unknown cost factor for 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 our, our, our for the community and stakeholders that are developing sites and 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 managing contamination, um, so we we're always got to be focused on that and understand that's really what we should be doing. Not assessing for the sake of assessing, but assessing to reduce uncertainty. That's really what the idea of assessment should be about. And then we've got to get better at communicating that uncertainty. It's not about consultants weaseling their way out of you know, tell us how much it's going to cost. And if I give you a range, the clients out there, if I give you a range. I'm not giving it to you because I'm weaseling my way out of it, or maybe I am, I don't know. It's because there is uncertainty, and I've learnt this, and, and, and we've all learnt this. And so really that's Ryan, what this is can you put... and, and, then, uh, and that's really my presentation, except for recognising Dusty for tomorrow night, because that's really important. So uh, happy <laughs> to answer any questions. Well, thanks, Ian. That was excellent. We have got quite a few early bird questions, which I'll read through now and then we'll shift to any Q&A questions that may have been lodged. So first early bird question. My experience is in water quality and contaminated land spaces. What is your advice to emerging professionals in this industry? I'm not sure how qualified I am in the, some of these questions, but uh, look, um, uh you know water quality is you know we the water quality isn't and runoff from from uh if we're talking about water quality runoff from contaminated land it's often something we don't specifically assess we we kind of feel if we can if we can manage the the contamination to the adopted criteria that we're that we um ass assess to around you know protection of the environment and the like we, we don't necessarily go and take measurements off our land always. I mean, we do in some cases and sometimes we have creeks running through our land, etc. I know water quality can be groundwater as well. So I, I said I'm not a water person really. I suppose what I say to you is, yep, yeah, let's don't, if you're an emerging professional, it's great to have a specialization, but make sure that, you know, contaminated land is a very broad practice, making sure we're keeping broad and understanding the interaction of water quality and, and the different um, interactions with the soil and the interactions with the groundwater and the like. I don't know if there's much in terms of advice. I mean, keep 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 yourself educated and, and, and make a specialty. Have a look where there's gaps. But, uh, you know, we don't actually look at that surface water runoff as much as, as maybe we could. Um, but I'm not really quite sure where that's going. But, yeah, sorry, not, not, not a great answer there. Uh, that's all right. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, my my comments on this is, there's complexity in, say, groundwater risk assessment and the interaction between groundwater and surface waters that's often got to be taken into account in managing contaminated land. 
And there's also ecological risk assessment work that goes on to determine the cleanup criteria that are ultimately adopted on sites. And that's quite complex work too, which does require good knowledge in water quality. And then you've got the construction phase where you've got to monitor water quality as part of that phase to ensure there's no ongoing risks. So certainly Hydrotera has been involved in a lot of, I guess, long-term water quality studies and monitoring associated with infrastructure that's interfacing marine environments that might also have a contaminated land aspect to it. So quite a lot actually in aquatic space of things. But as Ian says, it's you, you do need to be a bit of a, um, a, a bit broad in, in terms of your application, but there's certainly some very specialised aquatic scientists working in the area. Question number two, what is known about micro-remediation in Australia? Oh, Richard, I think that one's well above my pay grade. I, I did <laughs> Google it before this, uh, <laughs> this call to work out what it is. So uh, it's just not my, my specialty at all. So the answer is probably I don't know much about it. So it's remediation by fungus, apparently. So um, I don't know if you have some response, Richard. Uh, I've seen it used um, in some of these copper chrome arsenic sites where you're dealing with, um, I guess it's creosote, I think, um, has had some success in that sort of side of things and on TARS, but uh, often bioremediation is a combination of stimulating the fungi as well as stimulating the other microbes. Um, certainly there's some good consultants out there that specialise in that sort of thing. Um, Environmental and earth sciences used to do quite a lot of bioremediation of, you know, coal tar residues and that sort of thing. But I'm a bit like you, Ian, not a guru in it. Question number three, is decentralised bioremediation of water quality issues for the Great Barrier Reef possible? Well, well above my pay grade. No, not my expertise at all, so can't answer that one at all. Oh, Ian, you can't pass on too many. Um, yeah, well, that, this is, was this a hydroterra question, this one? No, but um, I don't actually know the answer to that one either. Sorry, we might yeah. take it on notice and come back to you. Question number four, how do you address uncertainty in soil volumes and costs so clients can be more confident in what they are facing at a site? Yep. Sounds like a Dorothy Dix to me, that one. I think that someone in my team said that one, so that's pretty easy. I think we've answered that one. Okay. We address un I, 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 my presentation was essentially around that. So essentially at the end of the day, addressing uncertainty in soil volumes and costs is, is about do, do the best you can in terms of that assessment, getting the, the quality history and assessment and, uh, and understanding the, your, your, your um, conceptual model and your strategy to try and minimise everything you can around the unknowns. And then after that, it's putting your contracting strategy in and your remediation strategy that then um, minimises the, the the risk associated with the uncertainty on the known. So it's sort of a just un recognising uncertainty through the process and putting those those couple of those steps in to try and minimise it. You know, can't reduce it completely, but you minimise it. And there's some sites where it's very difficult without actually starting to turn soil. So, yeah, that makes sense. Question number five, what can drillers who work with environmental engineers on contaminated land sites generally do better to assist sampling? Again, look, I, I, I'd probably say I haven't been on a drill rig for 20 years, so uh, I'm struggling, uh, struggling on that one. Um, I mean, just from a, a managerial point of view, uh, you know, the the making sure that you know it's a recognition from my point of view that the drillers have so much experience in this area uh, that that when I send young engineers and scientists out with drillers, to me it's always about learning from the drillers 
and making sure that they've got a role in this as well and passing on the information that they have. And to me, that's a question. It's almost a question and a discussion with the people that are out doing the sampling as to how, you know, what, what are things that we're seeing that, that could be done better and, and the processes that we can that can be done better. So I think it's just working together. And, and I recognise drillers have expertise that I think the industry really needs and making sure that that expertise is passed on to our young people is going to help. And but I'm not sure if there's a whole lot more I can come back with on, uh, on on what I'd like to see. I mean, keeping up with the technologies around the world as well and your understanding as a driller, your expertise in your industry and making sure that we're bringing to Australia what we can in terms of, of some of the techniques around um, the in situ sort of uh, sensing uh, and the like. Uh, that's that's a role too in 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 uh, for the drillers to play in the industry as well. I think also just a bit of guidance at the start of the project on what drilling methods most mm. suitable. Um, Agree. There's there's a lot that can be, you know, geo probes versus augers, etc. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, we had a pretty good presentation by Matrix Drilling in a previous webinar might be worth having a look at to the person who's asking that question. Number six, how is the determination for ongoing management made and what is it based on? I'm assuming this is ongoing management of contamination risks. I mean, uh, yeah. that, that's a that's a big question at the end of the day, but essentially it's around uh, it's around risk assessment and making sure that the residual risk can be managed by the party that that, that has the, the duty to manage that into the future, that's really what it's based on. If the risk can't be managed to the satisfaction of whoever's signing that off, then that's basically the point at which saying, no, we have to do something about it. We need to remediate it. But that's kind of as, as hard as it gets to me. For me, it's, it's making sure the risks are okay and that they, and there's someone who can manage it or the, the person in charge of the site can manage it. And that's basically the basis for it. It is often a whole, though, isn't it? Like uh, you might go through this really rigorous process to, you know, get a development up, and then you've got some ongoing groundwater management area or that sort of thing, and it gets tied in with the title of the property sometimes. But mm -hmm. it does seem to be a tricky thing to make sure it keeps going for forever. And, and and I do at the start of a project very often I'll be saying what's the ownership structure of this development even though we're still with you know we've got sheds on the side or whatever if you don't know the ownership structure if if, if the client can't have own owners corporation or strata title and there's going to be a management outcome then you, you can't have that in your strategy so this what's the point in putting a management outcome as, as part of your strategy if you can't actually if there's no one at the end of the day, you can manage it. So it's a really important consideration right at the start of a project to get your strategy right. Absolutely. I would say that that's an excellent question and one that needs further consideration. Question number seven, the cost of remediation seems to be very high. Does anyone in government do a cost benefit analysis of remediation policy Costs versus environmental benefit. So I'm not in government. Uh, so I don't know. But the interesting point is, what is a remediation cost? Uh, as I've said, there's two. There's often two parts. This one is the cost to get to a an audit or a DSI or whatever it is. And the other one's the development costs, and and often they're all this development cost is being said it's a it's a remediation cost. Half the time we get these massive costs in development for managing contaminated soil is that point that I made before around the form of development. I mean, if if we go and put a strategy together where we're, where we're saying you need to have, you can keep all the soil on site for the proposed use as long as you put a, a separation layer and build above it. And then the first thing a developer does is cut a basement that realises all the contamination. Is that a remediation cost or is that a development cost? So to me, there's a it's about design and making sure the design is commensurate with the contamination. And if you don't get those two right, you're in for a whole lot of pain in the development. Sometimes you've got to have a basement because that's the form that's in these some parts of the cities. You can you must have a basement. That's just the way you're not going to sell a place without it. So that needs to be considered right at the start. So 
is the cost of remediation high? Look, I think we're remediating stuff that doesn't need to be remediated. But again, it's just, it's about, um, you know, the, in, in some clients' minds, whether they're government or not, they want a clean site. A clean site means no no contamination at all in, in resi for residual soil uh, on the site. So nothing that will cause a development problem later on. So, well, why are we remediating that? Why can't we just build over it? You know, so so to me, it's it's this question. It's it's more a question of asking what you know what what is a what do we want? What, making sure that we're the the outcome that the the client, be it government or not, is trying to achieve is, is married to the to the future life of the site, and it's not some arbitrary outcome of a of a clean site because that's what our policy is. So. I don't know if that really answers it, but I don't think we think about the outcomes that we need. Sometimes some clients don't think about the outcomes that they need well enough, and at least a very high cost. All right. Well, that concludes the early bird questions. Um, I'm going to hand to Jane, who's going to read out the Q and A because we've got a slight technical issue here today. Mm -hmm. Jane, have we got some questions? We do. Thank you. Uh, first question is from Ryan Trevina Ward. Um, hi, Ian. Regarding the developer who finds the underground tank during main works, was that a gap in expectation? Well, it depends on what information the developer had uh, prior to, to doing the works. It might be that the report said there could be underground re residual underground infrastructure. Uh, um, so that's one end. The other end is if you're a developer buying brownfield sites, and you, I think there needs to be a recognition that there this uncertainty that I've talked about that you could find a tank. I think that's within the realm in many of our sites. It's in a realm in the realm of of uncertainty. So to me, I think it's just alignment of expectation. Um, uh, it, it's it's a hard question. Uh, I don't think it's beyond the realm of expectation to find a tank on any site, really. Um, uh, and if it's if it's had a previous use, the site if the site's had a previous use, uh, we'll do the best we can to find them. And if someone's, you know, if it's a service station, and well, no, that's not. True. If it's a service station, no tanks have been pulled out, then I think there's a problem with the work that's been done. But if it's a you know a, a site that was always used for housing and there was a tank, well, I think that's reasonable still. There could be a heating oil tank underground that no one ever knew about. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's part and parcel with developing brownfield sites. You win some and you lose some. Okay. It's Thank that you. unknown. <laughs> Next question is from Bernie Chomley. Do you think in Australia in 20 plus years, due to cleaning up sites and improved regulation, there won't be a market for Enviro consultants or contractors, or there will be more unknown unknowns? Yeah, I, I think I've already seen the, the um, you know, asbestos is a classic where you think you're on the downward slide, yet we've got this resurgence in cleaning up asbestos. I'm not underrating the significance of asbestos. I'm just saying in the way the industry was moving. I mean, we've seen PFAS and the, right, and the amount of work that's been generated out of PFAS, on, rightly or wrongly. Um, uh, yeah, so what's next? Is it microplastics? Is it... What's it going to be? Uh, I don't think we're necessarily getting, you know, while we've still got landfills, while we've still got other thing, other industries uh, the like that we're still um, uh, producing uh, con contaminants in our waste stream and that waste stream is going astray or pipes are leaking or whatever, we're still going to have contamination impacts on on society. We're still going to find things that we don't, know now that are going to be a problem in the future and i think as i say pfas is a classic in the in recent times so you know i thought i'd see my career out i thought i wasn't sure if i'd have a career for 35 years in contaminated land i was probably there at the start of it i mean there was older people you know the the, the first batch of orders were there just before, you know a few years before me but there's still as much work as anything now because of as much a thing around expectation and regulation and also maybe knowledge around some of the impacts of some of this contamination so I think we're still going to have an industry for quite some time, unfortunately. I think it's probably going to become more work rather than less. I agree, yeah. Okay, next question is Martin O'Rourke. 
when did they stop using asbestos in mastic? Uh, specifically, I don't. Oh, I wouldn't know the. Oh, that's not quite my expertise. No, there's probably someone in the office here who, who knows that, but I don't actually know it. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, when all asbestos products were banned in the eighties, would that be right? In the eighties, I think it was. And then defence wasn't until the two thousands, late eighties. So, oh look, I don't know. So it'd be sometime. It'd be would have been sometime around that sort of late eighties, early. I think period. I I don't don't quote me on that. I don't know. I don't fully know the answer, but it's about. I think it's about that timeline. Okay. Next question is from James Stewart. Have you seen biochar entering use for remediation of contaminated land, or is it still rare and early? I haven't seen it. No, it's used more as a soil ameliorant, but not not for remediation as far as I'm aware. Okay, next question again from, oh, it's a, uh, more of a statement from Martin O'Rourke, who says, great talk brings back happy memories of a past employment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thought that might make you laugh. Um, the next question is from an anonymous attendee. I'm from a groundwater and contamination background and looking to delve into PFAS investigations. Any advice? I'm going to show my bias because I, uh, look, I'm just giving you an opinion. I, I don't like PFAS. Don't like PFAS work. I just don't like it. Main reason is the horse is bolted and I think we've, we've got some problems in uh it's everywhere essentially pfas is the probably the worst contaminant i've seen in that it's everywhere and it's mobile um and i think we're still and, and the emerging issue around criteria and what what's acceptable um i think we've still got a way to go so it's been a very uncertain process and i've done, done some re reasonable pfas projects over this period of uncertainty which has taken its toll that i'm not really i, I lack interest in it so I shouldn't be saying that as a consultant. Any clients, if you want PFAS, yeah, come and talk to me. But um, <laughs> no, uh, so look, I, I'm probably not the best. I certainly ran groundwater and PFAS. I mean, gee, I mean, it's massive. It's a massive issue in the end of the day. And I'm not sure it's something we're going to solve, but that's just me. I don't know enough about groundwater. I think there's a an ALGA talk coming up about that there is a solution to it. So um, what's my advice? Just... Don't don't limit yourself. Just find whatever projects. There's all sorts of projects. Just because PFAS might be the contaminant of interest at the moment, there's all sorts of projects out there. Don't limit yourself. Contaminated land is great fun, great, really interesting. There's so many every day is a, a, something different. So don't limit yourself and just say, I'm I'm interested in groundwater. I'm going to go and find out, get on all sorts of projects related to groundwater. I wouldn't limit yourself to PFAS. I'd also like to add that if PFAS is the crisis that it seems to be, feel free to throw yourselves into it to help solve it. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Next question, Lewis Brown. Do you talk about conceptual site models still? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely important. It's really the art of our science. It's really putting all those facts together, whether you draw it, whether you do the tab tabular format, whether it just sits in your mind as part of your strategy. Um, it, you've got to put all the facts together to create an illustration of what's going on because that's what you base your advice on. So conceptual site models are extremely important, whatever form. Okay, next question question do you think regulators like epa should also inform the general public who are also our clients about uncertainties in assessments as this might help remove pressure and bring better appreciation of our roles i agree but it's very hard to talk about i think well, i'm trying to think it just comes to mind there was some example of that recently in the in the in the media and someone got absolutely nailed by talking about uncertainty around it. And I can't remember what it was now, but I, I agree. Yes, 
I think we need to, all of us have a role, sorry, all of the professionals who understand contaminated land have a role in in un, in recognising the uncertainties that we're dealing with and how we're dealing and being explicit in how we're dealing with it or or communicating that. And EPA, I think, also has a role, uh, definitely has a role in it. Now, EPA, unfortunately, has to be at the front line of some of this communication and has to actually go out there and, and almost say it isn't uncertain, that the risks are acceptable or whatever. You know, there's some some element to their job which is quite difficult, I reckon, in terms of fronting the community because they're seen as the as the you know the the, the authority and the and the technical um, head of, head head of this. So, um, but you know, I, I I think we all have a role in educating the community. And remember, the community in the end of the day are, are clients of the environmental consultants, whether they be the people that use the park that we're working with a council on, or or the kindergarten that they send their kids to. So we, we do need to make sure that we get our society a little bit more educated in these things. And just because there, there is uncertainty doesn't mean the uncertainty could be within the risk realm that we're happy to deal with. Just because it's uncertain doesn't mean it's a problem. It's just uncertain. Great. Um, and an, another anonymous attendee, what opportunity is there in the industry to increase data density with lower costs? i.e. more screening, less samples, or alternative methods for intrusion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a bunch of different techniques out there, and we mentioned it when we are talking about the drilling as well. Um, there's a bunch of different techniques, and it's just really about uh, people uh, adopting them more widely as well uh, in terms of as, as screening techniques. Um, but ultimately, I suppose in my experience, because of some of these other things around development and, and the like, the fact you're going to next, you know, the next day after you finish your assessment, you're going to dig a massive hole and and whatever. You actually need to visually have a look at some of this material because the what you what you yeah, you know, it's one thing sensing things; it's another thing actually visually con confirming some of this because of the, sometimes there's you know there's geotechnical issues involved, there's reuse issues in terms of the material and things like that so just because we've sensed it and and understand the plume or whatever it might be if we're going to go and dig some soil we still need to understand some of the characteristics of that material so i think there's always going to be a play for uh, a place for an intrusive investigation but in terms of the techniques that we use to try and better uh, inform our conceptual model 100 percent. i mean we're, we're down the cleaning up winchester the winchester uh, facility down in, um at mulap and you know, I'm using XRF. So XRF has been around for a while, but you know they're very reliable now in terms of the the um, the readings we're getting on the metals. And so we're reducing the amount of samples we're sending to the lab to use them as a screening tool. And look, I'm not the greatest at talking about all the different technologies, but there's a whole bunch of screening technologies. Some don't. Some, in my experience, haven't necessarily added value to projects, but others have. So there's definitely a place for it. And I'm sure over these next 10 years, 20 years, we're going to develop. A whole bunch of different methods and i don't know i'm not an it but ai i'm sure will come into it as well and being able to better interpret some of the data rather than just have people with experience interpreting uh they ai will have a place as well so i think there's a whole interesting really interesting um future when you come to big data and a lot of contaminated land comes is big data it's a lot of a lot of data that we have yeah i think um maybe just to add to that this whole high resolution site characterization is certainly a sort of thing if you're fairly new to the industry to look at to get mm. some answers to your question um over the period that you know hydroterra has been operating i've seen really big advances in geophysical techniques so you literally have tens of thousands of measurements generated from one survey and they can help characterise where contamination is going and help to clarify where to locate wells you know, to intercept plumes. And then you've got things like these soil vapour absorbents, which people can drill and put in very rapidly and leave them in the ground and then come back and collect them for analysis. And that really speeds up characterisation and gives you a good, a better spatial characterisation of it. And you've got, you know, MIP side of things. You've got multi-level groundwater characterization. So there's a heap of um, different ways to get more data. Um, but probably the exciting ones I'm seeing now are 
around that geophysics space where you can really get a three-dimensional conceptualization of where a plume's going based on a geophysical survey. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, Jane, next question. Okay. Uh, next one is more of a statement, um, not a question. It's from Andrew Sacco who just wanted to express thanks to Hydroterra, Richard Campbell, and Prenza Ian Kluko for facilitating this presentation. It was a great high-level overview or summary of remediation projects and the challenges that may be encountered throughout each project. We at Ausdecom have worked very closely with Ian across numerous medium to large-scale remediation projects over the years as a remediation contractor. Ian's practical yet thoughtful or yet thorough approach to challenges encountered across differing remediation projects has been the cornerstone to many remediation project success. Keep up the great work and thanks again. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, that's Anyone? all our questions. Excellent. All right. Well, Ian, I think that last question slash statement was a pretty good summary of um, a very successful and thorough career, and I could only uh, echo those comments. Um, so many thanks for presenting today, and uh, I think you've passed on some great learnings to the next generation. You've talked a bit about being old and close to retirement, given I'm at the same phase you are, I think uh, you've got at least another 10 years in you. But, um, many thanks for presenting today. No worries. Thanks very much, Richard. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Audra Talk soon. <laughs>